makes in favor of European trade goods. But what else besides stone and clay have we found at Ndolnabem? We have found food, vegetable and animal remains, especially pieces of burned bone. From these we now know that our relatives back then, like we ourselves in more recent times, had a broad base of foods available. They ate bear, caribou, deer and moose, as well as many smaller mammals, beaver, muskrat, squirrel and otter. They ate turtles and birds, including duck, loon and woodcock. And they ate lots of fish, elwives, swordfish, white perch and trout among them. The Elwife remains tell us that our relatives were here every year in early spring when the Elwife run comes up the Denny's River from the sea and into Medibems Lake. Medibems, plenty of Elwives. We still come here to catch them. The swordfish remains tell us that our relatives caught these giant fish in the Gulf of Maine in the summer and brought them to Ndulnabem. Our relatives also ate a variety of fruits and vegetables, including blueberries, bunchberries, and cherries, acorns and hazelnuts, which they gathered in the summer and fall. There were traces of other plants too, plants used for beverages and medicines, including sweet fern seed, sarsaparilla, bed straw, and sumac. One plant, Wizoeskil, grows along the Denis River, and we still use its yellowish roots as an effective treatment for sore throats. All of these bits tell us that our relatives lived here from spring through fall. We also know that at times our relatives came here in the winter. We have always moved to follow the food, places of abundant fish and shellfish in the spring and summer and places closer to big game animals in the fall and winter. In the early winter, there was one fish that was an extremely important food, tommy cod. We called the fish bunam, which means frost fish. It is still important today. The tommy cod run lasts about a week. In earlier times, we would load cedar bark nets into our canoes, which we paddled along the ocean shores to our favorite streams. We would net the bunam where the streams meet the sea, and after a long day, we would head back to our villages with full baskets. Some of us carried our catch up Gedanusk to the settlement at Ndulnabemk. There, all of our relatives would join in a bunam feast. The remaining fish we preserved. If the weather was cold enough, we let the fish freeze without cleaning them. They kept better that way. In warmer weather, we removed the skin and bones and then dried the fish on birch bark sheets or smoked it above a fire. Then we would mix the fish with maple sugar and wrap it in birch bark. We now know that Nulnabemk was a busy place. Our relatives here made tools and pottery. They processed the food they caught nearby and the food they brought in from other places. We know that the area provided a rich array of foods for much of the year. It was also a place where people stopped on their way upstream and their way down to the sea. Much of what we found is very old, some of it almost 9,000 years. And this tells us something else, something very interesting. This confirms that we were here when the rivers flowed the other way. Here is the story as a scientist might tell it. As the glacier retreated about 12,000 years ago, it left behind tundra and tundra woodlands. Soon the land surface was dotted with marshlands and shallow ponds, including Medibems. Meanwhile, 
Freed from the weight of a mile-thick layer of ice, the land sprang up, tilting the landscape, and the rivers started to flow north. At Medibems, the lake drained northeast through Stony Brook, directly into the Squadeg River. But eventually, the land settled back, and nine or 10,000 years ago, the water flow reversed. Stony Brook began to flow into Medibems, and the Dennis River outlet was cut at Ndolnabemk, carrying its waters south to the coast. Our relatives settled Ndolnabemk soon after the waters began to flow south. Some of our stories say that the rivers actually flowed north until the white man arrived. Still, there are things Nulnabemk has not yet told us. Sometimes what we have found there has just raised questions. This might represent part of a whale's fin. But what about this? It is more than 4,000 years old. Its shape is evocative. It looks a bit like a porpoise, or maybe a sturgeon, or other fish. Is it a tool of some kind? A fishing weight? A gauge to make nets? A fishing lure? Or is it an amulet? Is it meant to represent something else? Does it have a meaning other than its function? Can it tell us more about our relatives? We are still thinking about what it might be. All this is to say that Nulnabemp was and is part of a larger system, a land with its network of waterways that has provided for the physical and spiritual needs of all our people for thousands of years. This site is just part of the picture, but it gives us a sense of our relatives' life here in earlier times. It was a life that was complex and rich, lived in a place that sustained us in every way. Skudeg and its watershed provided everything we needed. And then something new happened. People arrived from the east, across the ocean, with the intention of staying. Wabno Gerwig had started trade with visiting Europeans by the early 1500s, and we certainly encountered European fishermen even earlier than that. We may have first seen them as much as a thousand years ago. One story, passed down maybe 50 generations, tells of Skijin men in earlier times seeing a monster approaching from the sea. This monster, when it came close, revealed men inside with their hair on fire. Likely, these men were blonde and red-headed Vikings, with the sun shining off their helmets. But more substantially, in 1604, French settlers arrived on St. Croix Island in the river at present-day Calais. This was the Europeans' first attempt to settle here. And we were there to greet them. At the time, 50,000 Wabno Kewiig lived in the region. After the Europeans' first winter of starvation, we brought them food. And so we named the island Matnuescus, the place where the food ran out. Though this colony soon failed, the French and then the English quickly spread along the coast and up the rivers to encounter and trade with more and more of us. They wanted furs. In exchange, we got things we did not have. At first, trading with them didn't seem to be too much of a problem, but things eventually went bad. Soon, European goods started replacing our traditional technology. So, for example, we stopped making our own pottery. We were starting to lose some connections with our culture. With the traders and settlers came missionaries. We converted to Christianity, further undermining our connections to our traditions and to our traditional values, which had tied us so closely to the land and the river.
Quickly, this contact became a disaster for us. With no immunity from European diseases, we were soon dying from epidemics of smallpox, yellow sickness, and dozens of other infections that swept through our villages. Less than two decades after the French tried to settle St. Croix, Black Plague exterminated nearly all of us. But more than this, the newcomer's way of life itself created terrible problems. They competed with us for the same foods. They harvested the salmon, pollock, alewife, and other fish we depended on. They hunted caribou, moose, and deer to feed their growing numbers. Eventually, the caribou went extinct. Even those in the caribou barrens, only a few hours travel east from Dolnabemk, where we had hunted them for hundreds of generations. The newcomers cleared land for farms, where they planted grain and raised cattle. And on the lands they were not otherwise farming, they harvested timber, eventually stripping much of the land bare. They even removed peat and hay from the marshlands. As they changed the land, they destroyed the habitat of those animals and plants that sustained us. Moose had no food. Beavers withdrew. Migratory birds had less and less reason to pause here to feed. Farming and the increase in cleared land created runoff that muddied squid egg waters and polluted it with animal waste, and eventually chemicals and poisons. It got harder for the fish to survive, and the once teeming waters got emptier and emptier. In time, the newcomers dammed the rivers to harness them for energy. But the dams did something else. They blocked the fish. Even though eventually fishways were constructed to bypass the dams, migrating species like salmon found it harder to run up river to spawn. The runs became smaller and smaller until eventually these fish were, for all practical purposes, gone. And as our food supply shrank, we had to abandon more traditional foods for ones that were foreign to us. And we started to grow sick in new ways, developing diet-based illnesses such as diabetes and heart disease. In the middle of all this, while changing the land itself, and making it less fit to sustain us, the newcomers were also simply taking our land away. The vast landscape and watershed that once provided ample foods and medicines for all, the landscape that had given us life, steadily got smaller. Now someone else owned it. Eventually, we held only two reservations, Zibayik and Indian Township. As the wildlife dwindled, the newcomers, now long since established and thinking of this as their land, passed game laws, further cutting our access to the few resources that survived. These food supplies were not just land and river based. Pasamokwadi means people who spear Pollock. And our stories tell us that at one time, Pollock in Pasamokwadi Bay and the Bay of Fundy were two to three feet long and so plentiful that we could pull them out of the sea by hand. But with overfishing by the newcomers, the stocks of what was once our most important food dwindled to almost nothing. The sea had also provided us with seal, whale, and porpoise meat. These mammals were very important to us as a food and as a part of our culture. Gluskub had taught us how to hunt whale and porpoise, and we had done so for thousands of years. But by the end of the 19th century, these animals were disappearing. In 1936, few people still knew how to hunt porpoise. This film called Porpoise Oil recorded the dying art. It shows a successful hunt in the Bay of Fundy. 
The old man, Matthew Picto, had been a champion porpoise hunter before the turn of the century. He had agreed to go on this last hunt to show how it had been done. Eventually, other people's laws prevented us from taking even this food, even though these laws violated our traditions and sovereign rights. One by one, our resources were taken away. We say resources, but we mean way of life. All these things, the plants, medicines, animals, water, the land itself, the ability to set out in our canoes and travel throughout the watershed, the ability to be part of squid egg, and all those things that sustained us. We were less and less able to live the way we had lived for countless thousands of years. We spoke out, though usually with little effect. In 1887, Oluizo, also known as Lewis Mitchell, addressed the main legislature to which he was a non-voting representative. Alwizo was also a tribal scholar. He spoke about early treaties that had guaranteed us the right to hunt and fish forever and about the continued taking of Passamaquoddy lands in direct violation of these treaties. People in Eastern Maine, he said, were getting rich from the timber harvested on stolen land Meanwhile, the Passamaquoddy were becoming desperately poor. Now this plainly shows us how much worse a people of 530 souls are. Stripped of their whole country, their privileges on which they depend for their living, all the land they claim to own now being only 10 acres. If one or two men in this body were Indians, they would fight like braves for their rights. Now look at yourselves and see whether I am right or wrong. All we want is to be left alone. Let us have this land to live as ourselves. By the beginning of the 20th century, the whole Wabnukewi population had been reduced to 12,000 souls. But though we struggled to maintain our way of life, we did not disappear. Neither did our traditions. They were still there. They are still here. For us, Dulnabemk is proof of that continuity. After we left Dulnabemk, the newcomers put it to their own uses. Eventually, they grew hay and corn here. But in 1946, what had once been our village was turned into a dump. The stockpiles of hazardous materials stored here began contaminating the environment. Dolnabemk, this once pure place where our relatives had made their lives, became poisonous to life. Finally, almost 40 years later, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Defense, and the main Department of Environmental Protection began to clean up Dulnabemk. From 1985 to 2001, these agencies removed hundreds of containers of waste oils and hazardous chemicals, including solvents and pesticides. They found and destroyed several thousand cylinders of dangerous gases, acetylene, hydrogen chloride, ethylene oxide, and ammonia. They removed asbestos and live ammunition. EPA removed more than 27 million pounds of soil contaminated with solvents, heavy metals, and PCBs, and installed a groundwater extraction and treatment system to stop the pollution from spreading into the neighboring water supply. Slowly, as these poisons were removed, Dulnabemk was returning to life, and as it did, it told us more and more about our relatives. By 2001, at the end of the second archaeological recovery season, we had found more than 2,000 tools and tool pieces, more than 37,000 stone flakes, and almost 6,000 ceramic fragments. From all those bits, we began to piece together a picture of what life had been like 
in those early days at Dolmabemk. <laughs> 